Good morning, family, and thank you so much for participating in this morning's service. I hope you all are doing very well. Wilson and I are doing great here in quarantine. Uh, we haven't come down with any symptoms yet, and I think we're going to be okay. Hey, I'm going to preach a lesson. Could you step out for a moment so, so people don't get distracted? Thanks, buddy. We're doing fine. The currency in this country that we live in, many of us, has printed on it, in God we trust. And that statement is currently, for many of us, being tested. And that is actually a good thing. I'd like to bring to our minds James chapter 1, verses 1, or sorry, verses 2 through 3. So let's turn there together. James chapter 1, verses 2, and, you know, let's go to verse 4. James 1, 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So we are to consider it joy when we meet trials of various kinds. Now, a quick note is that the trials themselves are not joyous, but the meaning of the trials, the being tested, is a joyous thing. It's not a joyful thing that people are getting sick and some are dying. That's not a joyful thing. That's a sad, difficult thing. But the testing of our faith is joyous. It's a joyous thing to have the opportunity to become more Christ-like, to be refined, and to grow See, we're told to rejoice always, but we're not commanded to be happy all the time. You see, happiness and joy are two different things. Joy is based off of truth. Joy is understanding the truth. He's set free by the truth. Because joy is based off of knowledge. Happiness is based off of happenings, which are always changing and circumstantial. So we are to enter into circumstances, especially when we're tested with joy, knowing that before we're even entering into it, that it is an opportunity to be refined and to grow. So with that in mind, it leads us to a question that I have to ask myself and you need to ask yourself, and that is, do you want to grow? Think about that. Do you want to grow to be more like Jesus? To frame that question and to show the consequences of how we answer that question, let's go to John chapter 15 and look at what Jesus says here. He's talking to his 11 disciples at the moment, and he's going to use this word abide 11 times in this moment. I, I personally imagine him looking at each one when he says abide. We're going to only read through where he says 10 different abides, but if you read on your own a couple verses later, he says the 11th abide. But listen to this thing, these things that Jesus says with the question of, okay, do I, do I want to grow? And what's the consequences if I do want to grow or if I don't want to grow? Let's look at this. I am the true vine, and my father, father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. 
By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that, you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So now the question is, after we see that we really only have two options here, growing or not growing, um, which let me first explain that, that we can see from this passage are two choices of we can either have connection to him and through that connection we're going to have a pruning process and then it also is full of love or we have this self-reliance and there's been a withering and a burning. So what are we going to choose? Connection, pruning, and love? Or are we going to choose self-reliance, withering, and burning? So the choices are to make, and it comes from, well, do you want to, do you want to grow? If you want to grow, you need to be connected and abide in Christ, which is going to lead to pruning, which is all part of also being a part and abiding in his love. So how then do we abide in? Because obviously that's the right choice. So then how do we do that? How do we abide in Christ? Well, I think Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, really lays it out for us. And that's going to be our core verse for this morning's lesson. So let's turn over there. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. So we'll read it through first, and then we'll go through it together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. So let's start here in the beginning with trusting the Lord with all your heart. Trust takes a long time to build, but is very quickly broken down. Many of us have experienced that with people we trusted, but then something went south and that relationship was damaged in an instant in many different ways. Has God ever broken a promise? Has he ever dropped the ball? You look at God's track record and you see that he is completely, entirely reliable. He is totally trustworthy. Excuse me, I have a sneeze and it's just tickling right in the back of my face. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> well, I'm not worried about getting anybody contagious, so maybe I don't have to even cover up. That'd be gross. Um, so, God is completely and entirely trustworthy. He is trustworthy, but sometimes life is confusing and, and difficult, and that's okay. So you see, it's not a sin to be confused in the different circumstances we find ourselves. We're told to always trust God. But sometimes our circumstances we find ourselves in are confusing. I think of Paul, who in my mind is just a spiritual giant. And we look at his life and we saw the things he experienced. Like we see that he saw the risen Jesus. We see that he had visions or somehow experienced heaven for a time. We see that he performed miracles and miraculous things were done to him. And we see, though, that in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, he says, I was perplexed, but didn't give in to despair. Or I was confused, but didn't give in to despair. So Paul, who experienced all those things that yeah, I'm not going to experience, even after he experienced all those things, he still had moments when he was confused. So that comforts me. And I was like, okay, if Paul can be confused sometimes, I can be confused. And that's all right. I can be in situations of like, I don't know why this is happening. But... I know that God's trustworthy. I know that he is reliable, even though I don't understand the circumstance. So it's okay to be confused, but we're supposed to always trust God. We're to, also told here back in Proverbs to trust him with all of our heart, not just some of it, not just most of it, but with all of our hearts. We're not supposed to put our the trust of our heart into anything else. We're supposed to share our hearts with other people, 
That's really good and a, and a great thing. But our heart is not supposed to be entrusted to anything. Our heart shouldn't be entrusted to our country. Our heart shouldn't be entrusted to our family. Our trust, heart shouldn't be entrusted even to our marriage. It's kind of like what Jesus says, lay up your treasure in heaven for your treasure is there. Your heart will be also. We share our, our, our trusting heart with other people. You know, our heart should be totally trusted to God. And then we then take and share that heart with, with our country and our community and our congregation and our families. But our heart is not supposed to, it's, it's guarded by Christ, not by these other things. We trust him completely with our hearts, not, not anyone or anywhere else. We're putting all of our eggs in one basket, basically, with God. And that's, he's, he's trustworthy. He's, he, he's reliable. So then we see, we're told not to lean on our own understanding. We are very quick to justify and rationalize with our human logic. And you just need to take one quick look at history to see that there's a lot of atrocious things done with clean consciences. Human understanding is not in itself reliable. It by itself is very akin to thin ice, where it looks stable, but when people start relying on it and basing their lives off of it, it breaks and it kills them. Our own understanding is not in itself reliable. Doesn't mean we're supposed to turn our brains off. God gave us our mind. We're told to love God with all of our minds. We see the Bereans and Acts are considered more noble because they were examining the scriptures daily, trying to understand them and see if certain things were true. So using the brains God gave us is amazing, but we're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. Doesn't mean we don't see, but we don't navigate this world. We don't make decisions based off of just what's going on up here. We make decisions what's going on in here. So next we see that we're told, in all your ways, acknowledge him. So all the time, two things are true. God is, and he is trustworthy. God is, and is trustworthy. So repeat that with me. God is, and is trustworthy. One more time. God is, and is trustworthy. That is true 100% all the time, no matter what's going on. And that's a mentality that we should never turn off. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And who are we acknowledging? Somebody who's trustworthy. He is and is trustworthy. In your marriage, he is and is trustworthy. In your health, whether you have a virus or not, he is and is trustworthy. Whether you have one dollar or no dollars or a million dollars, he is and is trustworthy. And this economy is up and down, whether you have a job or not, he is and is trustworthy. As our culture changes and our country is seeking how to handle this, he is and is trustworthy. It's always true. Now, <coughs> excuse me, the result of all this, of trusting the Lord with all your heart, not leaning on your understanding and acknowledging him in all your ways, the result of that we see here is that he makes your paths straight. Now let that sink in. Let that be refreshing. He makes your paths straight. God didn't just wind up the world, throw into motion, step back and say, good luck, you guys. He steps into our world and makes our paths straight when we trust in him and acknowledge him and don't rely on our own understanding. He makes our paths straight. There was a time in my life, uh, several, about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago now, when I was a missionary in South Africa, and me and my teammates almost died because of something irresponsible I did, where I convinced us that we should try to swim in this area of the ocean to get out to these rocks, and long story short, uh, there was a riptide there, and I knew that it was there, and I thought we could make it out there to these rocks, and I was wrong. And we got caught in this riptide, and we're treading water out there for over 40 minutes, and nobody knows where we're at, and we're in some really deep water, and we're swimming and swimming and swimming, trying to get back to shore, and we look up, and we're even further out than where we started, and 
this fear started to set in where I thought, is this the end? Is this how I die? And I got mad thinking, how dumb is this? There's, this is such a dumb way to die of being irresponsible. And I remember praying to God, God, this is, this is so, this is a dumb way to die. There's got to be a better way to go than this. Well, you see, South Africa is also very well known for its great white sharks. And I had an image come to mind of a great white shark. And I thought, oh, Lord, okay, not, not the shark. Please, not the shark. Uh, after swimming more and more, and long story short, we eventually, through swimming and drifting and being pulled out, we came up, it was so deep, we couldn't see the bottom. We ended up coming over this, this sand bridge that went several hundred yards back to shore. That was like in four feet of water. We were able to get a footing and it went straight back to shore. And we made it, exhausted as we were. And I look back on that and I see it similar to what we're reading here. When we trust in him, we pray to him, when we come to him, when we acknowledge him, even in our difficult circumstances, he's going to make a straight path. He's, there's going to be a path that's going to be provided. Now, where is this path going to, though, for us? And the paths that God makes for us, they go straight to him and to his people. They go straight to him and his church. God makes paths for us to relationships, to eternal relationships. I th so Annie and I have a child on the way. And it's going to be a boy, supposedly. And we don't have a name picked out, but we kind of have like a code name, nickname picked out. We are reading Romans 16, and there's a name in this list of, of Christians that were involved in this ministry and workings and connection with Paul. One of, the, one of the guy's names is Andronicus. I think it's a great name. Uh, I want to, and Andy seems like a great nickname or shortening of, of Andronicus. It means valiant warrior or mighty man. And uh, so Andronicus is kind of our code name, nickname for our son. Uh, well, we were reading this passage in Romans 16, and we see Paul recognizing all these people that he had become connected to through Christ, even though he wasn't physically present with them. And I see so many parallels between that list and what you and I are a part of right now, where we have trusted in God and he has made our paths straighter and intervened in different ways. And he has then led us to each other. You know, we, we, we're added to, we, we come to God, we're, we're baptized into his possession, and then he adds us to the church. And we're now part of something. We've been led to something, it's someone. We've been connected to each other. Even though we're not physically present, there's still these bonds together. And that is so beautiful and powerful. So I want to read Romans 16 and uh, several verses there. So let's turn there. And a lot of people usually look at this as just like, man, that's a lot of hard names to read. And some of them aren't commonly used anymore. Uh, but these are our real brothers and sisters from almost 2,000 years ago. These are real relationships, real bonds of the church together. And it's really beautiful and powerful. And a lot of these names could be replaced with you and I and fit just fine. But let's read this and let's look at these, these straight paths that God has led these people to and is leading them to. So Romans 16, starting in verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church of Sinria, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need of you. For she has been a patron of many and myself as well. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epentheus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. 
Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to all the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampelatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Statius. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord. Greet Tamphania and Typhoria. Greet, beloved, uh, greet the beloved Perhis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asenkreist, Philegion, Hermes, Petrovas, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nerus, and his sister, Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. I read this, and I can't help but see so many parallels between you and I and all the other saints that are participating in this stream. I think of Robert and Carol down south. I think of the Hess family that are in Hawaii. I think of the Boswells uh, up in Fairbanks and all the saints there. I think of the Crockett's and the Scott's and the Daniels and the Bergs and Bolases and Munsells. And I think of the Kazmerzaks. I think of uh, my family. That I, uh, I think of all of you. There's many of us the different congregations that are part of this time here together. And even though we're not physically in the same room, that doesn't mean we're not connected. God has brought us together. And that connection we have is still present even though we're not in the same room. And I see Paul expressing that, and I feel and experience the same things because it's the same type of dynamic today. God has made our, is making our path straight. And he's leading us to him and to his people. So now, continuing back in, in Proverbs, our last verse here, or last two verses here, be not wise in your own eyes, verse 7. It is a reinforcement of do not lean on your own understanding. In case you missed it the first time, yourself is not reliable. <laughs> and then next we see to fear the Lord and to turn away from evil. Right now, many people are having to choose between are we going to fear the Lord or are we going to fear this virus or the uncertain future of consequences of this situation. Are we going to fear the virus? Or are we going to fear the Lord? I want to read to you an excerpt from C.S. Lewis's um, writings on living in an atomic age. Just a few years after the first atomic bombs were deployed, there was a lot of people that were fretful and, and anxious about the reality that an atomic bomb could disintegrate their city at a moment's notice. And there was a lot of fear at the time about the possibility of these bombs. And there's certain elements of that that um, I see parallel to a lot of thoughts in the media, thoughts right now, uh, social media. And so I want to read this little excerpt here as I find it relevant to what we find ourselves in. So, excuse me. Also, I'm wearing pajama pants because I've had a bucket list that I would preach in pajamas one of these days, and today's that day. So, here's some writings from C.S. Lewis I find very relevant. In one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age? I am tempted to reply, why as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year? Or as you would have lived in a Viking age, when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat in any night. Or indeed, as you are already living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented, 
and quite a high percentage of us are going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, ascetics, but we have that still, and it is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made, and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing something sensible and doing human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and over a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. Now, I don't mean to diminish the gravity and the reality of the circumstances we find ourselves in with this virus and other things going on. It's serious, and like we've seen, things like Daniel and other people have said that are helping us understand on the government and medical side, we should be submissive to the government, we should be mindful of social distancing, I'm isolated here in this cabin, quarantined here in this cabin, but what are we trusting in? Are we fearful of God or are we fearful of this virus? What is dominating our minds? What are we giving our minds to? Whom are we trusting? That's my question and that's where I'm looking to the word for answer. We trust not in our own understanding or in this world. We trust God and his word. So re the result of all this the conclusion to all this, verse 8, we see it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. God is a healing God. That is very comforting because we all are sick in different ways. He is a healing God and God will heal us in every way if we follow him he will renew our minds he will cleanse and preserve our souls he will eventually even give us new bodies he is a healing god we have a, a mission student we've had many over the years but one of them was really wrestling with something and i have this weekly counseling with all of them and and we were talking together and something was coming up and they uh they were expressing it to me, and, and I said, we really need to pray for healing about this, and we need to help, uh, we need to look to God for, for healing in this area. And they said, well, I didn't come here to get healed, I came here to spread the gospel. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. This is a healing gospel, and our God is a healing God. And if we don't let him or desire him to heal us, how can we express and 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 connect to people and, and hand them and deliver a message of healing if we don't allow it to heal us how can we share something we don't have how can we take somewhere we don't know how to get to we need god's healing and from this passage we can see how to receive it our god is a healing god in conclusion, there's a passage in Hebrews that I think sums up everything that we looked at this morning. So let's read Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, as we wrap up this morning's lesson. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. See the turning away from evil there? And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy and understanding 
that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and seated at the right hand at the throne of God. Consider him, you know, acknowledge him in all your ways, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. We're being tested in this, and that's a joyous thing. Let's look to Jesus for our joy and for our strength in this time. So let's trust God, not anything else. Let's see the joy that Christ has provided. Let us also let go of evil or anything that's holding us back from drawing near to God. Let's let go of our own understanding. Let's go. Let's let go of the fear and let's be healed by following the paths that God is making straight to him, straight to him and straight to his church, straight to eternal relationships. I love you and I'm so thankful that you've been a part of this service this morning. I can't wait to see you again in person and I know that this is a time for us to be refined and for us to become more like Christ. Let's make sure that we are people who are trusting in him and also being healed by him and that we are inviting others to join us in this in these paths that God is making straight. Let's trust God and not anything or anyone else. I love you and look forward to seeing you.